is Mark Cohen, the author of Overweight Sensation, The Life and Comedy of Alan Sherman. And I'm talking with Saul Solomon of Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Oh, shalom, goddammit, shalom, everyone. This is Rabbi Saul Solomon, the spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am so thrilled and excited and happy to be talking to an author, a man who not only writes books, but he writes books about Jewish themes. Oh my God, let me, let me tell you some of the names of these books that this man has written. He's the author of Missing a Beat, The Rants and Regrets of Seymour Krim, that's a very Jewish sounding name, and also Last Century of a Sephardic Community, which I have to read at some point. But the book that I have read and that I'm very excited to talk about with you here on Dave's Gone By is about the comedy songwriter, and also the game show maker, but mostly the comedy songwriter, Alan Sherman. You know who this is. He did the, the Hello Mother, Hello Father, and Sarah Jockman, and he made fun of the My Fair Lady in a Jewish way. So, his life, well, has kind of been neglected since his death. As, as most bodies tend to be since their deaths, because they're underground. But, a man by the name of Mark Cohen, has written a book called Overweight Sensation, The Life and Comedy of Alan Sherman. It has been published by Brandeis University Press. Ooh, hoity-toity, big thing there. Mark Cohen is on the phone with us. Hey, Mark Cohen. Hey, Mark Cohen. How's by you? How's by you? I am really squirming to hear of Alan Sherman from another Jew. That would be you. So, Mark Cohen, what made you write the book about Alan Sherman? Well, I wanted to talk with you, Rabbi. I wrote the whole book in order to have this interview with you. I've been a fan for years, and I didn't know how else to reach you. Why, thank you. If you've been a fan for years, why have you not been sending me money? <laughs> you know that's what I need more than anything else. Forget the accolades, the ad adulation, uh, you know, the group, well, okay, the groupies I like, but money would be better. <laughs> Anywho, so you, what made you pick for your third book the topic of the late and sometimes great Alan Sherman? Well, I had always been a fan of Alan Sherman's. I grew up with his albums in my house as a kid. My parents had My Son the Folk Singer, his first album, and one of the greatest comedy albums, I think, ever. It's really a terrific uh, piece of work. And also his My Son the Nut that had the Hello Mudda, Hello Fada song on it, and also a lot of other great tunes like You Went the Wrong Way, Old King Louie, and One Hippopotami, and others. Oh, I love that. I love one hippopotami. We're going to have to play that one. Because yeah. it's so clever and so sweet. I, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And um, at a certain point years ago, I discovered his autobiography. I had never heard of it, called uh, A Gift of Laughter, which came out in 1965. And I read it, and I thought, you know, this is a fascinating story. If some of this is true, or most of it is true, then his life is a heck of a story. Uh, and of course... There were a lot of things left out of the book because he wrote it and he wasn't going to say certain things about himself. And also it ended, of course, well shy of his decline and the troubled part of his life. So when I realized at a certain point about four years ago that this summer would be the 50th anniversary of Hello Mudda, Hello Fada, ah. I decided, you know what, I got to get on this. Uh, because the book has to come out this summer. If I miss this opportunity, it'll never come out. So I got to work, I found a publisher, and here we are. Well, this, this is great. But how did you find this publisher, though? This is not just any old, because everybody's now self-publishing books, but you found a real university press. Uh, what did you just, uh, did you have a connection to them, or did you just float them uh, pricey? What did you do? Well, actually, I was lucky enough to land a literary agent. Oh, went out and searched for potential publishers and found uh, Brandeis University Press, which sounded great to me, and they're a terrific press. So, yeah, I was very fortunate. I got very lucky, I think, and uh, the book has been very well received. Just this morning, I saw the uh, latest review, which is in the forward, which called it an exhaustive and gripping new biography. So I'm you called me on a great morning, Rabbi. I'm feeling good. Oh, I'm glad you are feeling... I'm never feeling good, so I'm glad someone in this world is feeling better than I am. But, so, so, let me ask, first of all, 
Granted, Alan Sherman's own biography, autobiography, was written in 1965, but he was also kind of known, even around that time and in the following years, for being pretty open and honest, almost too honest about what was going on in his head, and, and, and in his bed, for that matter. In your discovery, how honest was he in the 1965 book? Well, he, he, there were a number of things that he wasn't going to say in his 1965 book. I mean, all of his extramarital affairs, he wasn't about to write too much about that. His drinking and his smoking and his fooling around. So there was a lot of stuff that was left out. Did he then go on and talk about that in The Rape of the Ape, which is a much later book that he wrote, to, he as you say, did, in the decline years? He did. Uh, that book, you know, that book never really made sense to me as part of his life until I did the research for the biography because it seemed to come out of left field for me. Um, what did this have to do with the earlier Alan Sherman that we knew? But as a matter of fact, there was a long, long, it was an enduring theme of his life, this search for a kind of complete freedom to do and say anything he wanted to do and say. And I found in junior high school, he had written a little poem called Catastrophe. And it was a very sly little poem when he was written when he was 13 years old that was a very sexually suggestive poem that managed to get by the censors and appear in his junior high school newspaper in L.A. Um, so it was something, he had sex on the brain from a very, very early age. In addition... What Jewish boy doesn't? That's, that's... that's he, he was very traditional from that point of view. Yeah. Right. It's an overlooked aspect. Uh, <laughs> I guess it was, um, it all came out of the closet with Portnoy, but uh, <laughs> this, this was well before that. So in addition to his love of parody, his love of word play, and his very strong interest in, in getting across a certain Jewish identity in his work, there was also the... Uh, Tremendous interest in sexual shenanigans that uh, he never tired of. He thirsted for his whole life, yeah. And, and the fact was, he was not an attractive man. He was an overweight sensation, as the, the title of your book says, or at least briefly he was. And yet, because of his fame and because of his personality, he was able to indulge in ways that a lot of uh, nice Jewish boys are not. So, yeah, and yeah. even before he became famous, I actually interviewed one of his college girlfriends. And... Uh, she said, you know, he wasn't very attractive, true, but, you know, he was charming. He was witty. He was a funny guy. He was out there. He's extroverted. He had a lot of energy, and um, he drew a lot of people to him, and the, and the girls were interested. And that's wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, if, if all Jewish men had that luck. <laughs> it's what they say. It's confidence and personality almost more than looks half the time. Yeah. Thank, thank God it's worked for me, let me tell you. But... Let me ask Mark Cohen one other aspect of his life that you make very clear in the book would influence his writing again and again was his really, really messed up childhood. And you don't have to go into a whole detail, but tell us a bit about his parents. Well, um, if you're giving out prizes for messed up childhoods, uh, he takes number one and everybody else is vying for second place, I think. Well, Michael um, Jackson's kids, maybe. I don't know. But anywho, yes. <laughs> uh, his mother and father were just two crazy people. The, the divorce proceedings, the records, are crazy. I mean, one was threatening to shoot the other. <laughs> um, the other left in the middle of the night and said, I took all the money and I'm not coming back. Uh, his father's life ended after an attempted 100-day fast. No food. On the 98th day, he died. Wait, he lasted 98 days without food? 98 days. Just it was almost it was almost like the two thousand year old man diet. You remember the two thousand year old man's diet? Remind me. Just cool mountain water, ten degrees below room temperature. That's it. That and a stuffed cabbage. That's right. That's right. But, but Alan, if he had the stuffed cabbage, he would have been all right. He would have been all right if he allowed himself the stuffed cabbage. But Alan Sherman's father allowed himself just cool mountain water, ten degrees below room temperature, and a little lemon juice. I can follow. The vitamin C. And um, he didn't feel too well on the 98th day, and uh, he fell down, hit his head, and died. Oh, my God. The mother married and married again and married again, and who knows how many times she was married. And her last husband was a Jewish gangster, a real goneth, uh, who had an FBI file the size of a small-town telephone book. Actually
actually, you know, in reading the book, you, you do call him a gangster. You say, I, I don't know if that's the, the real word. I don't know. You don't make it sound like he was mob or, or Jewish mobster connected more along the lines of he was just a con artist and a small-time thief. Well, actually, the FBI file seems to suggest that he was connected with organized crime and was looking into bribing public officials around the country to allow gambling to be uh, instituted in certain states. Uh, and one of the pieces of paper that, that was found on his body, I should mention here that he shot himself to death. He put a gun in his mouth and blew his brains out when the police were knocking at the door. So that's not what a small-time crook does. Uh, the rumor in the family was that Dave Siegel, which was his name, thought that it was other wise guys who were after him. Uh, and rather than be taken by the wise guys, he killed himself. But in any case, he did kill himself. The police came in and found papers that the FBI later got a hold of, and uh, that seemed to point to uh, involvement with organized crime. Now, how did all this madness with the mother and the divorces and the moving back and forth and the, the gangster, how did this affect Alan Sherman as a person, and then how did it affect his art? Well, as a person, what happened was Sherman's parents were so unbalanced that they couldn't raise him. They never had a stable enough life to raise him. So his mother frequently sent Alan from L.A., where he was mostly growing up, back to her parents in Chicago, where she had grown up, and where Alan, in fact, was born. So Alan lived with his maternal grandparents in Chicago in a really Jewish neighborhood in the Humboldt Park neighborhood. And he grew up with, in a Yiddish-speaking household with his grandparents. In, in the book, you make the, the grandparents sound crazy, but really lovable. I think well, you know, they were a great influence. And one of their children became an alcoholic who died very young. And, of course, there was his mother, who was also nuts. Um, but by the time Sherman met them, uh, they were older, of course, and their children were grown. And from Sherman's point of view, as a kid, they were lovable, cranky characters. Um, his grandmother was a poker player. His grandfather was a bit of a drunk. His grandfather took him to the Yiddish theater and the, uh, and the Jewish, uh, the schwitz, the bathhouses. His grandmother made all this wonderful food and was a, you know, a small-time petty thief and, uh, and a poker player. And everybody spoke Yiddish and there were lots of relatives around. So it was a lively, colorful very enchanting, exotic world for a really bright but horribly mixed up kid of 11 or 12 years old. Who came, I guess, to associate love with food and food with love. On some also level. Jewish life with the both of them. Mm. They all got mixed up together. Jewish life, love, food, they all were inextricably linked together in his experience. Um, you know, his mother left behind that world and Sherman embraced it. And the irony, of course, was that instead of his mother raising him to be this non-Jewish American out in the new world of L.A. in the 30s, and she made sure to change her husband's last name from Coplin, which sounded a lot like Kaplan, and she put an E in the middle, so it was Copalon, so it was a little less Jewish. And she gave birth to him at the, the Norwegian Deaconess Hospital in Chicago instead of one of the Jewish hospitals where all the Jewish families went. Um, but the irony was, because she was too messed up to raise him, uh, she had to send him to her parents, and then there he became attached to Jewish, Jewish life, and it never left him the rest of his life. And he wrote often about his grandparents, and that great song, Shake Hands With Your Uncle Max, is like a wonderful celebration of his early life surrounded by lots of relatives in Chicago. I have to say, one of the great, it, it's so small, but it's so perfect. The, my favorite moment in that song is Stein with an E-I and Stein with a Y. Well, that, that's that is just a terrific rhyme. And I'll tell you how well loved that sh song is. And is it, as an example, your listeners can go onto YouTube and type in Larry David and shake hands with your Uncle Max. And they will find a video of Larry David singing that song when he was a special guest at a concert uh, of the Boston Pops Orchestra, uh, I think in 2011. He was invited and he was able to sing just one song and he picked Alan Sherman, Shake Hands With Your Uncle Max. I mean, it's a song that's loved by great comedians who know what good comedy is. And uh, Well, what, is, what do you think is so special about this? It's not just a list of names. It's, it's 
a community in a way in a song. It, well, I think we're first we're underrating what it meant in 1962 because that appeared on his first album in October 62 to proudly announce a litany of all these very ethnic Jewish names. I mean, this was not a time in American life where people proudly introduced themselves as Sam Pincus. You know, these names were still, they still elicit a chuckle. There's something funny or a little embarrassing and silly sounding about these names. And Sherman's announcement of these names uh, and delight and joy in them was really a, uh, it was a breakthrough. It was a real social breakthrough. And again, you're right. He also painted a world that he loved and belonged in. These were supposedly his relatives. This was his family. Um, and it was the families of millions of Jews in the country who related to this group of people and their names. And there were Jews, I won't say caught in the bind of assimilation, but the idea that they wanted to, they wanted to change their names, they wanted to be more white, they wanted to have the picket fence in the suburbs, they could, you know, they could celebrate the holidays, but they don't talk about them in public. And here's Alan Sherman saying, why the hell not? Right, exactly right. And, and Sherman came along at a point when everything was changing. I mean, there had been changes before Sherman. I don't want to make sure, you know, the easiest way to undercut my argument is to make it too big an argument. I mean, people were starting to do this kind of thing. And the 2,000-year-old man came out in 1960, and uh, Jackie Mason was around. But Sherman came around at that early moment in 62 and produced exactly the right material in exactly the right way and the, and the choice of parody to subvert all these well-known songs that had absolutely no Jewish content and to hijack them and kind of smuggle Jewish names and Jewish stories into the American culture by stacking these songs with, uh, with all this Jewish content. It was a brilliant technique, and he did it perfectly and with great wit and humor and great joy, and it was just what everyone had been waiting for. It was the perfect material at the perfect moment. But which came first with Alan Sherman? Was it uh, the game show and the work in television, and then he, because the parodies didn't make him big until 1962, so at what point was he doing the, the Funny My Fair Lady, and at what point was he working for TV? Well, he was always interested in Jewish parody throughout his life and in Jewish material. Uh, and it started as early as junior high school. I mentioned one junior high school poem. Another one began, Humpty Dumpty sat on a train, happily singing, Bemir Bistu Shane. Okay. So there it is. He, he knew himself as a Humpty Dumpty, which indicated both his weight and also his fragility, right? A Humpty Dumpty falls and no one can put him back together again. So even as a 13-year-old, he was a Humpty Dumpty. He was singing and singing Jewish material. That was a big hit for the Andrews sisters in the 30s. So then he went to high school. He went to college at the University of Illinois. He went to New York in 1945. He tried to make his living as a, uh, a comedy writer for different acts. He wrote a Broadway play that was almost produced. The New York Times reported that it would open on Broadway, but that it never did. Uh, it was called The Golden Touch, and it was a parable of assimilation. It took the King Midas story, where King Midas had the golden touch, and it turned it into a story about a Jewish busboy named Medosevich, yes. who shortens his name to Midas and tries to fit in, and everything goes wrong, and he changes his name back. Then he, he co-creates I've Got a Secret, the television show in 1952. He's living in the New York suburbs. He's got a good job. He's making money. And at that moment, his, his mother dies in 1949. And when he's kind of set with his family life, he's married, he has two children, he starts writing Jewish parodies of Broadway musicals. He writes the parody of My Fair Lady that you talked about. He writes parodies of other Broadway musicals. And he starts becoming very well known among his friends for singing these songs. And the first recordings of his Jewish parodies take place at a friend's house in Great Neck, Long Island, in New York. 
and I discovered those marvelous recordings. Your listeners can hear them on YouTube. If they type in something like, there is nothing like a lox, <laughs> they will find Sherman's parodies of the Broadway musical, so, and they're terrific. These, these parodies did not even make it onto the Rhino, uh, Rhino Records box set that they released a few years back. This yeah, that was 2005. It's more than a few years, and that Rhino collection is terrific, and it does include his complete parody of uh, like five or six songs from My Fair Lady. One of, one of the best is he turns On the Street Where You Live to On the Streets Where We Live, or I like to call it On the Streets Where Jews Live, and there's a line that goes, We've got Scarsdale men, we've got Great Neck men. And just lately, we've been sneaking into Darien. Uh, That's a great line. <laughs> which is great. Um, but these other songs never appeared anywhere, still have not appeared anywhere. The only place anyone can hear them is uh, the YouTube tunes that I posted. Yeah. Oh, that, thank you for doing that. We, we have to go to YouTube. I'll try and find one. Um, if I can't get it to play on the show, then please, everybody, go look for it. You, do you have your own YouTube channel and people can go to that? Yeah, yeah. What um, is it? It's, it's got an unfortunate name. It doesn't have the word Sherman in my YouTube channel because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But it's Mark Cohen, Sherman, YouTube. You'll, if you search around, you'll find it. Look for, there is nothing like a locks. Look for 76 Saul Cohens. You'll find it. Definitely. Absolutely worth doing that. We are talking, by the way, with Mark Cohen. He is the author of Overweight Sensation. The, uh, or the biography, excuse me, of Alan Sherman, The Life and Comedy of the Man from Brandeis University Press. So we make it to the point where he's doing these parody songs, these Jewish-flavored parodies of Broadway musicals. As a matter of fact, there's a wonderful uh, line that uh, they have recorded of him saying, What if all these Broadway musicals were written by Jewish composers? Which they were. <laughs> Well, it was funnier when he said it. Anywho, <laughs> no, it was a terrific. It was a very. It was a terrific line and very, very uh, ahead of its time. I mean, he was early to realize. I mean, this is the late fifties when he was saying this that there was Jewish culture in America that was passing as a just plain old American culture, and he wanted to draw attention to the fact that these were Jewish contributions to American culture that, as I like to joke, the Jews gave to America without asking for a receipt. So Sherman, Sherman wanted to uh, include this material in the idea of what Jewish people did in America. It wasn't just synagogue life. But how did this all go from being just Jews at parties and, and his fellow people in television laughing at these parodies to a first album that suddenly became a hit and, and now President Kennedy is singing one of the songs. Yeah, it's an amazing story. So he was living in New York. Uh, he lost his job with I've Got a Secret. He pitched another show which was picked up for production, which was called Your Surprise Package, which almost never, no one's ever heard of because it lasted less than a year. But that show brought him to L.A. in 1961. In L.A., he continued singing at house parties these songs. An agent, a famous agent by the name of Bullets Durgum. Bullets Durgum? <laughs> Bullets. Is, is, he was called Bullets by a... Apparently, he had, there were three brothers. One was named B.B., one was named Buckshot, and the other uh, called Bullets. I got gotcha. three, you. These three crazy nicknames. And uh, Bullets knew everybody. And he pitched Sherman around town, got Warner Brothers Records in interested. Warner Brothers said, sure, we'll cut a record. You know, it won't cost us anything. And they made sure to tell Sherman parody songs in the public domain. And that's how it became folk songs, which was a perfect idea because we were in the middle of the folk song revival, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and so forth. So Sherman recorded this album, wrote this album in just a few weeks, Recorded it on August 6, 1962. Warner Brothers released it in early October. Billboard and Variety reviewed it and said, it's funny, but no one outside of New York, L.A., and Miami is going to buy this thing. This is just for Jews. They didn't use that word, but they used euphemisms, such as the New York, L.A., Miami axis. Right. And then it started selling and selling and selling. And in three and a half weeks, it sold almost 400,000 copies. 
and soon it was a million copies, and soon it was 1.2 million copies. It went gold. It was one of the hottest records in the country. It hit number one on the Billboard ch uh, album charts. And this was clearly no longer just an in-group phenomenon. It was selling big in Atlanta, Georgia. It was selling big in Washington, D.C. When Washington, D.C. was a small kind of southern town, it wasn't the big metropolis that we know it to be today. Uh, so it was hitting a, a chord with millions of Americans of all different backgrounds. And by the way, we should say this is still even before what Alan Sherman is most known for today, which is Hello Mother, Hello Father. Right. That's not on that first album. No, no, it's ten months before, his, before Hello Mother. Uh, his reputation and his stardom was not built on Hello Mother. It was built on the very Jewish album, My Son the Folk Singer. I mean, it's amazing to look at the album today and see what Jewish material it was and how it, it went off the charts. There are songs like The Ballad of Harry Lewis, which is a parody of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, one of the most serious kind of almost holy songs in the American uh, repertoire. And instead of God trampling through the vineyards where the, the grapes of wrath are stored, it becomes about a Jewish garment worker who works for Irving Roth, and he was trampling through the warehouse where the drapes of Roth are stored. Um, and they were just terrific. Ter and it was Shake Hands with Your Uncle Max. It was Sarah Jockman. Well, that, that was the one that uh, President Kennedy knew. Was yes, there's a story that I report in the book. There's a famous story about, uh, about Kennedy in the lobby of the Carlisle Hotel in New York, singing Sarah Jockman. It can't be confirmed. Oh. I, it can't be confirmed, but there is a famous photograph that I pr we produce in the book of Sherman and Kennedy meeting. And there's no doubt that Kennedy was a fan. In fact, the Kennedy White House sent Sherman uh, a note congratulating him on the album and thanking him for the album, which was played at the White House. That was in November of 62, just shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis ended. Uh, crisis, the crisis right. ended, excuse me. The White House sent a little note to Alan Sherman. So it was a gigantic hit that spanned the gamut of American society. And it didn't stop there, which is, I mean, Sherman was both indefatigable in, in, a, in a certain way, and he was just on one of those creative roles. Yeah, he was, he was hot. He was on a roll. This or album, on a bagel, as, as Jews would say, yes. Yeah, he, he came, this album came out in October. By the end of December, My Son the Celebrity appeared. And that album, of course, has his, one of his most brilliant songs, which is Harvey and Sheila. I mean... That parody of Havana Gila is, I think, just timeless. It's just fantastic. It replaces the lyrics that no one understands. No Jews know what Havana Gila means, and it's just a kind of sentimental celebration. It's very nice. But Sherman saw that it's an avoidance of American Jewish life, and he wrote a very factual, journalistic kind of song about what American Jewish life is really like, and it's terrific. I think it's just brilliant. Um, Harvey and Sheila moved to West L.A., uh, joined the GOP, that's the way things go. It's, uh, it's a right. brilliant song. That album also goes gold. It doesn't sell as many copies as the first. It wasn't as great an album in every single respect, but it went gold. Uh, it became a giant hit, and then he began a cross-country tour. He toured, I forget off the top of my head how many cities, but it was close to 20, and uh, appeared on television constantly. He was a monster, monster hit. And then, of course, in the summer of 63, you have uh, Hello, Mud, Hello, Father that appears as a single. Oh. Almost 700,000 copies. And what, when, when was that released? In late July 63, almost exactly 50 years ago today when we're talking. Then about a month later, it comes out on the My Son the Nut album, which becomes the number one album in the country from the end of August through the middle of October. For eight weeks running, it's the number one album in the country. My God. 
I mean, it's the thought of it, as you say throughout the book, of just where Jewish culture was seen and what Alan Sherman meant to suddenly Jewish culture, in a way, coming out of the closet, just before Fiddler on the Roof, of course, and, and other things that would before pull Fiddler, you out of it. which is often seen as a breakthrough moment. This is before that. And, of course, he was writing also wonderfully about general American culture on My Son the Nut, which is not a very Jewish album at all you start to feel like the beginning of what Seinfeld did later on. That is, describe American life generally from a recognizably Jewish point of view and a Jewish flavor to the speech and the names, and yet without it being ethnic humor. I mean, the, the songs on that album, they're, they're terrific songs. Here's to the Crabgrass about the love-hate affair, uh, love affair that uh, Americans have with the suburbs. Should they live in the suburbs or the city? It's a terrific summing up of the whole problem that's still with us today. Our making fun of television commercials with the song Headaches. It's and just terrific fun nonsense. And but, but was that Alan Sherman's downfall in a sense of when he moved away from directly Jewish things, America wasn't so interesting because it wasn't such a novelty anymore. Um, and then he lost his popularity. Do, do you say his popularity went down just because he, he was not taking care of himself and living a very wild life? Or was his material weaker without the direct Jewish influence in it? I think his material was weaker. And it's, it's interesting to try and figure out why. Part of it is moving away from his first Jewish material. Part of it is also because I think Sherman had a long-standing, a lifelong, practically, determination to do what he did in these first three albums. And I think he was left with a problem that a lot of people are left with when they fulfill a lifelong quest, and then it's not clear what they should do from that point onward. Sherman succeeded so massively and brilliantly with those first three albums and answered all of the, the desires they had been thirsting for his whole life. I think he was left with an open question as to what to do next. Uh, was there something that he was really dying to say and do next? And I think the output of his next four albums, or it might be five, I'm forgetting off the top of my head here, shows that he had a limited amount of material left in him. So it was a number of things. It was a change in the culture. It was the arrival of the Beatles. It was the arrival of things like Fiddler. And then in, by 65, Jewish culture was really coming out of the closet. There were terrifically successful albums like... Uh, when You're in Love, the Jewish, Whole World is Jewish. When You're in Love, the Whole World is Jewish. And Dan Greenberg came out with the book how to Be a Jewish Mother, which is a was a gigantic hit. So you could see Sherman's influence in all these succeeding products, culture products, that were Jewish that left him behind. So he was a pioneer who had tremendous success and opened the door to a lot of other things that became successes and uh, left him it left him behind. Do you think it was also perhaps a bit of the, the public domain problem of the sense that he might have been writing even more and better parodies in the later albums, but the, the songs that he would have done, he couldn't get the rights to? I'm not sure that that's really the case. I, don't, I can't say that I think that's the case. Um, he did a great parody of Downtown, the terrific song uh, that was a giant hit for Petula Clark. And he immediately produced a hit parody of it called Crazy Downtown about the parents left at home wondering what their kids are doing while they're downtown. It's a good song. It's a really, really good song. No, I think what happened with Sherman was he said almost everything he needed to say. His fame went to his head. His personal life, he, he really screwed up his personal life by divorcing his wife and, and really indulging his sexual fantasies in a way that was just really overboard. I mean, attending an orgy, group sex... Now, wait a minute. Is, there, is that really so bad? Quite honestly, I've never been to one, unfortunately. I've been to a couple of Hadassah meetings, but other than that, no. I mean, okay, it's one thing to say that he ate and ate and he took drugs, but uh, stooping, 
What's so terrible about, about, about stooping? There's nothing terrible about stooping, but I think the the orgy and the group sex parties seem to indicate um, a man out of thirst, control. A thirst for an in, uh, uh, for intense experiences, transgressive experiences that that was hard for him to satisfy. I mean, you know, you go to an orgy, okay, you go to an orgy. That might have, like, satisfied your your curiosity. But there were several other group sex parties that he engaged in that even at the time people thought were a little over the top. So even in the mid-60s when the sexual revolution was really, you know, getting going, not everyone did these things. Only a small subset of people did these things and um but but see charlie sheen did did fine why couldn't alan sherman <laughs> well it wasn't a, it wasn't a public issue for sherman but i'm just i'm bringing it up as an example of where his life was going and meanwhile his wife was willing to keep the ball rolling in the marriage and they had two young children it was sherman who divorced her which was also a crazy thing for him to do and a very self-destructive thing for him to do so from a number of different angles, his life and his career were being bombarded, either through friendly fire of his own making or the culture changing or his own uh, pioneering efforts being picked up by others who made successes in the same vein. And yet when you think of all this and you're saying it was downhill and he was doing all these things, meanwhile he was still pitching shows, he was appearing on TV, he was, um, well not as much of course, and he was busy writing a book. Was he manic? It wasn't as if he was doing nothing, but his, his album sales kept selling fewer and fewer copies. He came out with his autobiography, A Gift of Laughter, which was given very mild reviews in the best of cases. Uh, his concert dates lessened, his chance at getting a TV show came and went, and by 67 his career was effectively over. Uh, that was the very last of his albums. His albums weren't even appearing on the top 100 charts. So things did go bad for him, but his life was still going on, and he was still able, as you say, to produce some fascinating bits of comedy and creation. One of the wonderful things I discovered was an unpublished manuscript called The Trip to the Perfectly Fair or Once Every 600 Years on a Tuesday. And it's a wonderful book-length work written in rhyming couplets like a Dr. Seuss book. And it's about two children, just like Cat in the Hat, who are left at home during the day and are visited by a magical being who give them lessons in life. And it's very moving and very funny. There are sections of it quoted in my book. And it really shows Sherman still in possession of his wit, right. his intelligence, of his insight. It's a very moving work. It really deserves to be published. It's quite a thing. And then, of course, he wrote The Rape of the Ape, the middle section of which, the middle 300 pages of which, is actually also funny and clever and insightful and satiric and a good look at the sexual revolution. And that came out very, very shortly before he died. Right, yeah. Uh, and he died of all sorts. Now, yes, life did catch up with him. His particular life. The, the drink, the drugs, he had, what, lung disease, and he was obese, and he had a heart attack. How did he die? Yeah, he had a heart attack. He had a heart attack, and he was working on yet one more creation, something that no one's ever heard of because it's never been released on anywhere, on bootleg or anything, and no one, no one knows it exists. And he said, this is going to do for golf what Casey at the bat did for baseball. And it was a terrific stand-up routine, not to music, it's not a parody, called The Gospel According to St. Andrews, uh, Hallowed Be Thy Game. It's about, about golf, the history of golf and how golf was created. It's like the Bible of golf, the Genesis story of golf. But you, you have found this or is this lost forever? No, it's in a warehouse in Warner Brothers Records. It's on a tape. Oh my gosh. And I was able to get a copy of it and listen to it. It was performed live at La Costa Country Club in Southern California, um, and it was really good. It has some really terrific lines, and it's about golf, the strangest kind of subject, and he talks about how the devil ruined it and made it an insane game, and it's pretty good. <laughs>
Golf has been uh, touched on by Jewish and non-Jewish comedians from the they, in the forties. They were all playing golf, and they yeah, every, all the and time. he loved golf. He was crazy, and that that song, that wonderful song, seventy six Saul Collins, his parody of seventy six trombones, takes place on the golf course, and it's it's marvelous. Everyone's got to listen to that song. It's just terrific. Seventy six Saul Collins at the country club. Seventy six Saul Collins playing golf. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, now, let, let me ask you, Mark Cohen, a, a, a question, though, and it's not a fair question. Uh, Alan Sherman died at 49 years old, amazingly enough. You know, he, he, he looked 49 from when he was still young and healthy, for God's sakes. So, but the, the question is, if he had lived another 10, 20 years, what do you think? Come back or kind of forgotten or brought on in the nostalgia circuit or... Creating other things. He would have ke he would have kept creating things because that's who he was. I interviewed a guy who knew him and in, uh, remembered visiting Sherman in the hospital at the beginning of the Watergate gay trials. And Sherman was in bed watching television in the hospital and jotting down names. And he said to his friend Ehrlichman, Haldeman, all the names rhyme. And he was writing parodies of Watergate, which unfortunately are completely lost. I've never found, they were never recorded, but I also never found any papers. And his family was very cooperative and lent me all the papers that they were able to find of their dad's works, but that never turned up anywhere. But it's a sign that his creative impulse would have never petered out. He would have kept looking around at pop culture and commenting on it and making fun of it. And it would have been fascinating to see what he would have done with all the things that happened over the next 15 or 20 years because he was talented, he was smart, he, he knew where the weak points are, what was important to poke at. I don't think we've seen anyone like him since. I don't think there's anyone been his equal since. There, there's no one that I can think of uh, with all due respect to uh, the great Al Yankovic. I think Sherman's in a class by himself. And in a lot of ways, your book does make that case. And for people who think, oh, he wrote cute, funny song parodies, and, you know, sometimes he was clever, he, you, you do make a case that he was more than that, that the cleverness and there was real wit very often in his work, and it was, you know, he had the brain to do careful things. And, and well, I, I think he had the talent. When you laugh at a comedian, the comedians are great at pointing out the obvious that we're all overlooking or hiding. And a, a comedian has to have a gift for noticing the obvious and calling attention to it. And Sherman had that comedic gift. I like to say about Sherman that he had the gift for spotting uh, new aspects of American life that would turn out to be permanent. So when he wrote about summer camp, when he wrote about the suburbs, when he wrote about television commercials, when he wrote a song called automation in 1963 about the coming computer revolution. It's amazing to realize that he was writing about computers back then and falling in love with a computer. I mean, this is what comedians have to be brilliant at, and he was. In fact, one of his greatest songs addresses one of America's biggest pop culture topics right now, which is our obesity epidemic. You can't open up the newspaper without reading about the American obesity epidemic, and on My Son the Nut, there's a song called Hail to the Fat Person, which is written about himself. So I think he would have been constantly on the money, spotting what needed to be talked about. And if he had lived even another couple of years, you know, the, the Dr. Demento show went into syndication, and that rediscovered a lot of the people. If, if what he did for Benny Bell not to mention where Al Yankovic could have been done to resuscitate, at least in a smaller way, perhaps, Alan Sherman. Well, you know what's funny? I, I find that Alan Sherman, sure, is not well-known among younger people, but among the people like you and I that grew up with Sherman, he doesn't need any resuscitating. It's amazing to me how many people remember him, love him over and over again, I talk to people and say, I'm writing a book about Alan Sherman, or I have a new book out now called, you know, about Alan Sherman. 
and people will say to me, I grew up on his albums, I can still sing you. Everyone wants to prove to me that <laughs> they know their, his albums better than anyone. Everyone's point of pride is, I can sing you every song from My Son the Folk Singer. I played My Son the Nuts so many times I wore out the needle. I mean, not many comedians have that kind of long-standing effect on their fans that 50 years later, they still remember with enormous affection their love of Sherman, their attachment to him, and their continuing uh, respect for his work. I think that's remarkable. I think very, very few pop culture entertainers have that kind of long-lasting impact on millions of people. Well, uh, that's extraordinary. I certainly hope that I will, but uh, yeah, I've got a long way to go at this point. We've been talking with Mark Cohen, the author of Overweight Sensation, the life and comedy of Alan Sherman. And let me ask you, know, we've had this wonderful chat about Alan Sherman, all about the book. Now, you're in that position of having written this and you're publicizing it, which is wonderful, and you'll, you'll be working on that for a bit. But you're a writer, you're an author, you're a bit of a scholar. You have to think, what next? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I know, I know. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Rabbi, I'm thinking. I've got a couple of ideas. Are they Jew-esque? Is they're, there Jewish? They're, yeah, it's, it's a fascination of mine. It's an ongoing fascination of mine. Uh, I'm looking for Jews in all the wrong places. <laughs> That's what I like to do. I don't like to find the obvious ones. I like to find the unusual ones if I can. And I've got an idea that I think I've settled on, but I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to talk about it. Poo-poo. Oh, oh, my God, the, the poo-poo thing. Poo-poo, Rabbi. If I say something, uh, Kanahara. All Jewish creative people are like this. They don't talk about it until it gets almost finished or fully finished. If you talk about it beforehand, you know, the, the bus will explode next to your hand and it'll chop your hand off and you won't be able to write. You know, or, or, or the, the, the genius that's in your head will fly out of your ears. You'll eat a piece of chopped liver, you'll have a stomach ache, you'll forget everything, it'll be terrible. Exactly, exactly. So whatever it is that you go and work on next, I hope it will be as well-written and well-considered and interesting and well-researched as Overweight Sensation is. Because it's a, it's a very, very happy that I read that book and very, very happy that uh, we're talking to Mark Cohen. Last question for you about Alan Sherman. Aside from Hello, My Hello, Father and, uh, you know, uh, Harry Lewis, and what's a song or two of Alan Sherman that people should know about? that's lesser known that you love and yet you think really deserves like oh if that had been on one of the first three albums everybody would know it but well there's a yeah. couple of really good songs on his later albums one is called chim chim Cheri, which is a parody of the mary poppins song about television commercials which i think is very very good she starts off chim chimity chim chimity chim chim Cheri. those are three words that don't mean much to me but I'm used to words that don't mean much to me from watching commercials on TV. Right. Um, and there's another song called Good Advice, which is a ton of fun, um, uh, <laughs> where the fat-headed narrator of the song, who is not Sherman, some people I think foolishly think Sherman is seriously taking credit for all sorts of wonderful inventions. Instead, it's just a very fun, silly song about a history of inventions that the narrator of the song is taking credit for over and over again. It's a lot of fun. I think those two songs are a good place to start. And also, one thing that I forgot to ask, since uh, the Dave's Gone by radio program that everyone is listening to now also dabbles in culture and in theater, is there anything salvageable in... Well, first of all, he, you said he wrote a Broadway play before he was really famous, but then after he was, he also did collaborate on a Broadway musical that was a four-night flop called The Fig Leaves Are Falling. Anything salvageable there? Is there a little bit of rewriting that could be done that could turn it into something worth seeing again? Well, you know, it was recently produced in New York for a very short run by a company that produces musicals that has very short, <laughs> very short runs. And was, the Times, was it New York? New York Times even wrote a little story about it and said, you know what, sometimes these things run very, <laughs> for, for, have short runs for a good reason. Oh. I'm not a good enough script doctor to know whether it could be revived and saved. I think its moment is past. I don't think we'll be seeing it anytime soon. Or the no, cast I album. Maybe so. If, they were, if would the cast album be worth listening to? 
Well, there is not a cast album. There's a rare, rare, rare album that was a studio production. Somebody I know recently found it on eBay and purchased it, but it's it only comes up for sale, you know, very infrequently. And other than that, the only recording of the show is at an archive at the New York Public Library, which is very difficult to get access to. So it's really an unknown work, and I'm sure is going to remain. But you you heard it. You, you, have you listened it, to the I did. I was able to get a recording of the show that was obviously recorded at a live production, and I was able to get a copy of that recording from the archive at the New York Public well, Library. Audio and visual, or was it just the, the music? Just, just audio. Just the audio, okay. Just so, audio. And what about the songs? There are a couple of songs that are really good, and there were among the terrible reviews that the, that the show garnered when it came out in 69, excuse me, a couple of reviewers had to admit that, you know what, a couple of the songs are really, really good, but that wasn't enough to save the show. Well, it's not enough to save most Broadway. I mean, you know, there are a lot more flops than there are hits. I mean, that just, There's, that happens. You know? that's, that, absolutely. It's no, it's no shame or sin to have a show that didn't work out. That's the way it goes. Absolute four-star hit, having Mark Cohen in the neighborhood with me, Rabbi Saul Solomon, on this episode of Dave's Gone by. Everybody, please go buy Overweight Sensation, The Life and Comedy of Alan Sherman. It's available from Brandeis University Press, and I'm sure you can buy it in all the usual places, the Amazon. Is there a, is there a Kindle version? Is there a, are there digital things? Yeah, there's an e-book, absolutely. Wonderful. And do you have, Mark Cohen, you, you gave us your YouTube site, but do you have a personal a website that people can... Yeah, the, a good place to go for everything Alan Sherman is alanshermanbiography.com. That's the website for the book, and it has links to where you can buy the book and all videos that I put up of all the lost parodies. That's a good central place, and from there you can click and go wherever you want. Please say it again. What was it? Alan Sherman Biography. No spaces or anything, just Alan Sherman Biography. Com. Alan Sherman Biography. Everyone I'm, should remember, Alan is two is A L L A N, not E N, and not one L. Two L's and an A. Two L's and an A, and Alan, and it's one M and a K in Mark. I don't even know what the hell that means. Mark <laughs> Cohen, God bless you. Thank you so much for sharing your book with us and sharing all this information with us. Rabbi, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, and you should live and be well. Oh, to 120 for you.